Hello everyone who's watching across the world and welcome to our 10th sci-fi virtual this time. So it's different for us as well, but uh, perhaps it is extremely fitting given the context that we all live in now. I don't think when 2020 rolled around, we realized how relevant sci-fi would be in terms of setting out a dialogue. And here we are, not just discussing the future for digital, digital democracies or digital outlooks, but more importantly, discussing what that means at a granular level for each one of us, both the haves and the have nots, and how exactly this bridge can be divided or filled at all. As you can see, I've got a, a very eclectic panel right in front of me. So welcome first to everyone who's joining in. For the benefit of our audience, let me run through quick introductions. We've got Onit Chaudhary, who's policy advisor, A21 program from the government of Bangladesh. We've got Kuda Hove, who's legal and digital policy lead for media institution of Southern Africa, Zimbabwe chapter. We've got Radhika Radhakrishnan, who writes extensively on internet and the gender. She's a researcher at Internet Democracy Project. And we've got Bayuti Jafar, who's a researcher at LSAM. So first up, a very warm welcome to all of you. Thank you very much for joining in this conversation. Because our, um, our area of interest or conversation today is digital rights and inclusion, I wanted to start with a slightly provocative statement, and then I'll draw all of you in for your points of view about it, which is that when we talk about digital technology or we talk about the need for digital inclusion, we are uh, working on the assumption that this inclusion is a good thing. So let me pose that at you all and I'll go, you know, one by one through my guests on what kind of digital world we want people to be included in. So could I, uh, let me start with you and then move from there. Um, glad to be on this panel. Just one small um, correction. I am no longer with the Media Institute of Southern Africa. I'm now a policy officer at Privacy International. My um, change yeah, is no. no problem. Yeah, um, so when we talk about inclusion um, as people that focus on digital rights, we're talking about an internet that is open, that is accessible, and more importantly, that is affordable because issues around access to the internet, issues around um, affordability, and issues around availability are the ones that are the main factors that make uh, digital inclusion a, such a big challenge in today's world. Um, like you said in your opening remarks, uh, 2020 has really shown us the importance of online participation and the need to, to have that online presence. And if we can't afford the mobile data, if we cut off what the devices that we need to access that online environment, then we are excluded from a lot of processes from education to work to even getting information from interesting um, events such as the sci-fi event right now. So it's definitely those three things, affordability, accessibility, and uh, availability. Mm. Onir, let me pivot to you on that because um, that has been the South Asian experience, has it not, where the difference between those that had access to this digital freedom had very, very different outcomes from the pandemic, whether it was during the lockdown, whether it is access to health or now as, as a running basis, access to education. You know, what, what have been your learnings from this whole um, discussion? Well, I'll give uh, an example from education. Uh, when schools were shut down uh, around the third week of March in Bangladesh, they're still closed. So about 50 million children and uh, young adults from primary to tertiary do not go to school today. So they have not gone to school for the last seven months, which basically meant a third grader uh, who was going to be uh, getting the fourth grade education. So third grader who actually went into fourth grade and got maybe two months of education, uh, forgot everything that he or she learned in the first two months and actually forgot everything that he or she learned in third grade. And now we're contemplating promoting him or her to fifth grade. So just imagine that situation. So don't remember third grade, did not get fourth grade, now I'm gonna be in fifth grade. So already we had a gap in education and now this is the situation that we're gonna be facing. So to prevent this, what we did was in uh, uh, April, early, early April, we decided that we will actually take education online. And we realized that that would only serve about maybe 20% of the primary 
uh, school going children and that may be about 35 percent of the secondary school going children and maybe 60 percent of the tertiary uh, but that would mean basically much less than maybe 50 percent so maybe 30 percent or so of the total population that would get online education to some extent so then we decided that okay why not use the parliament tv that we have that was not in session and that actually gets broadcast throughout the entire country so why not put educational content on tv and that's what we did we uh, in about two weeks uh early april we actually put a lot of content on tv and then we did a survey in in july and realized that only about 55 percent of the kids actually were getting access to that so this is this is a situation where we, uh, despite all honest efforts, using old technology like TV and new technology like internet, we tried to put educational content. So just from an access standpoint, we were not able to reach most of our kids. And mm -hmm. from the standpoint of affordability, internet was not affordable. So just, just one example of how we created a divide by putting content. Now we have maybe about 10% of our children who have gotten the fourth grade education that they were supposed to get to some extent, and then 90% didn't get much at all. I mean, 50% probably didn't get anything, 40% got to some extent, but obviously it's difficult to interact with teachers and other students. It's, it's a very different uh, engagement altogether. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, how do we deal with this situation? So I think that's telling of what, what uh, digital means actually give us. Absolutely. I think education and health, two very sort of crucial sure. and vulnerable areas. Uh, Radhika, the, the conversation slices through at gender at pretty much every intersection, uh, whether it is accessibility to a device, whether more importantly, the woman actually owns that device to have any control over it, and then whether she has access to any, any sort of options in terms of work from home or any other digital right as it may be. Um, has 2020 made things much tougher for uh, women um, as a whole, or do you think it's opened up the conversation? Where should we put ourselves? So I think what is, first of all, thanks for having me on this panel and thank you for the question. Um, I think what we're calling the new normal has quite been the normal for a lot of people. And when we look at, as you said, any field, there is a gender angle to it because women get left behind in most of these aspects. So even if you talk about education, like we've been speaking about, um, it's not just enough to have access, but that access has to be meaningful for people. So if I, as a woman at home, have a phone in a lot of cases in India, that phone is usually a shared device in the family. So I don't have autonomous access to it. So if I need to use it as a girl child, I'm going to be deprioritized in that family. And it's usually the boys who will be given priority to accessing that device. Now, what you do on that device then, whether it is access uh, some kind of education, whether it is you know use it to get jobs or work, all of that is still secondary because you don't even have that kind of autonomous access to it. And we've been noticing that, especially in cases of domestic violence, for reporting such cases, this is really diff ha this is really difficult for women right now because during the lockdown, cases of domestic violence have increased drastically globally, and especially in India as well, women are not able to really report these instances because all methods of reporting have gone online, or you require a phone to call up a helpline. And even as a woman, if I have a phone. If I'm living in a house with uh, another man who is the person who is abusing me, just think of how difficult it must be for me to use that phone to then call up someone and complain about the same person, especially when I know that that person can check my call history because it's not my own phone, it's a shared phone. Uh, so a lot of these kinds of barriers are there where it's not just about having access to the device, it's about having access to a space in which that device can be meaningfully used. So it's not just about the privacy of that data, you know, it's privacy about it's it's the privacy of the space I'm in and how that connects to the privacy of the data uh, through the phone. And I think in that context, especially women really get surveilled within the house and their 
there's a control over their access to technology as a form of controlling their actions and their bodies and their ability to get help in such situations. Hmm. But you think this is the tricky one, isn't it? Because along with this clamor for you know greater digital access comes the dreaded S word, which is surveillance, because you know that's how the term goes. Cell phones are basically big brother's tools. Are you concerned about the ramifications of this for citizenry at large in terms of how large organizations and governments become larger than life in the digital domain? Yeah, uh, OK, uh, thank you uh, for your question and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Wahyudi from Institute for Policy Research and Advocacy. Uh, you, uh, you call ALSAM. It is the Indonesian language. So yeah, the issue of the inclusivity is part of the importance problems in Indonesia, especially because we have uh, the big uh, issue with the digital divide until now. So if we uh, discuss about the digital access, the major problems uh, still relate to the digital divide, uh, knowing the uh, inequality of digital infrastructure in Indonesia. Uh, meanwhile, the pandemic situation has forced the acceleration of the digital transformation to happen, uh, such as the order to walk and school uh, from home and but uh, the not only uh do relate to the internet access infrastructure, but uh, some part of the society uh, also don't have access to the decent uh, devices, including the problems of the expensive cost of the internet uh, data package. It is the, the, the major issue in, in, in here. Uh, in this regard, uh, the last one, the government took the Ministry of, uh, the Ministry of Education uh, tried to uh, provide of the subsidy, uh, uh, subsidy uh, of the internet uh, data package, uh, especially to the student uh, in the high school level, senior high school, and also in the uh, uh, university. Uh, however, there are still uh, other challenges in here, such as the capacity problems in using of the digital uh, devices, uh, for example, uh, for the senior citizenship or uh, for the senior citizen or the digital immigrant, uh, because uh, they are heaven of the what is. Uh, uh, the enough uh, the capacity and the knowledge how to uh, uh, operating the digital device etc so uh, i think it is the the the, the challenging uh, for the south country uh, such as of uh, indonesia especially or uh, south as southeast asian country or india the other issue uh, related to the inclusivity also about uh, how the people uh, can uh, protect their rights, uh, especially the issue of the right to privacy and the issue of the freedom of expression. Because uh, currently, uh, during the pandemic also, we have uh, this uh, several issue, including the criminalization of the critics to the government uh, in the handling of the pandemic of COVID-19. I think mm -hmm. uh, this is my response. Kuda, let me come to you with that same question and the point that Vayudi raised about how the pandemic might have become uh, an excuse almost for the state to become stronger and stronger. So whether it is stamping out, you know, difference of opinion politically or an individual itself, uh, should we fear that when we are having this conversation about digital rights and inclusion? How much do we want to spread this and is it at the cost of freedom? Um, so. I, I totally agree with Wahuti, uh, what uh, Wahuti has said, um, that uh, the way that some of the responses that we've seen have been used have been to actually not totally deal with COVID-19, but to, to entrench um, things that we already had seen in some of these governments, where they were silencing critics, where they were looking into people's communications, uh, breaching their right to privacy. Um, so the reason for that is because uh, from my understanding and from my work is that, especially in, in Southern African governments, we find that there is a lot of fear about what digital inclusion means for democracy within that country. When people have access to online spaces, people can express themselves more freely because there's issues around protection of identities. So if I take a pseudonymous account or an anonymous account, then I am able to really say what's in my heart about the way government is running the country. And that possibility of people using online spaces to exercise their political and democratic rights 
is seen as a threat by governments. And that's why governments fight through various means to make sure that there is no digital inclusion. So when we talk about issues around affordability of the internet, to governments, that's not really, to some governments anyway, that's not really a priority because it actually works in their interest that people are not connected online. That's why um, you see in some countries, there's a lot of effort to put in these laws, which really try to restrict what people can say and do in online spaces. So those are another element or another side of uh, the fight for digital inclusion that we see being sponsored by states in a move to prevent people from finding a strong, consistent voice in online environments. Sure. Only, uh, do you agree with the observations that Kuda has made? And just to extend that point, uh, you know, is there a way to create alternate mechanisms or alternate paths for those who are either unable or unwilling to access digital tools the way the state would like them to, or the larger majority would like them to? I'll just repeat myself. So I'll, I'll talk about a couple of things. I was in a conference about two years ago in Bangalore. Where we talked about financial inclusion, not just digital inclusion and looked at the, the state of finance for the next uh, eight to 10 years, uh, 2025, uh, 2028, that kind of thing. And uh, CGAP, which is a group called Consultative Group to Assist the Poor, which has done a lot of research. Uh, it's a World Bank hosted organization, research organization. They've done a lot of research on uh, financial inclusion, especially in the digital realm. And they uh, talked about two studies they did, uh, they had done. One, uh, which is more uh, in the developed countries, northern countries, western countries, another in the developing countries, southern countries, so to speak. And uh, one of the key things that came up as a, as a, as a, as a I would say, concern uh, in the developed countries was privacy. Uh, the concern in the developing countries was not, was not privacy. That was not the top concern. That was quality of service. Uh, so, uh, as countries mature in terms of service delivery, in terms of probably socioeconomic uh, condition, I think priorities change over time. So we're talking about uh, privacy, we're talking about uh, security and all of that, confidentiality. I think uh, this will become a lot bigger concern in developing countries uh, in, the, in the coming coming years. It is not right now. I mean, that's my sense. In general, it is not at the, at the same level as, as the quality of service they get education, healthcare, disaster management, entertainment. So I think people are more uh, concerned about the quality and not, not privacy and confidentiality yet as much. But having said that, uh, so the concern is whether my data lies with the government or a very large corporation which may even be bigger than my government. I think those are both concerns. Uh, and uh, regulation in a very creative way maybe in a way that we have never done before, I think is, is probably the answer. I mean, there's this book uh, that Andrew Keen has written called How to Fix the Future. I mean, this is a book that is written after he wrote uh, Internet is Not the Answer, So, where he talks about how the negative aspects of Internet is actually bogging us down and it will not have an open future for us. But then he cites a few uh, solutions in the next book, which is How to Fix the Future. And there he talks about a new form of regulation that would apply to not only uh, large companies which hold a lot of data, uh, but also it will apply to governments. I mean, governments have to have, have to abide by uh, those same regulations. I mean, this is this is probably uh, very true right now as we are gathering a lot of data. I and mean, if you look at the case of uh, Trace Together in Singapore or Arugya Setu. In, in India, which have created concerns about how much data the government or the large companies are holding and how this data is being used for surveillance. Uh, it's probably used for service delivery, but also it can be used for surveillance. And we are seeing the big botherism in many countries that is being applied. So it is a big concern, but I would I would probably balance that. So service delivery and, and, and uh, privacy, I think we need to, to, need to balance that and find the uh, find Point. Radhika, there's, uh, there's regulation, but then there's representation. The problem also within this entire digital landscape is, uh, are we being able to hear the voices of women enough? 
are they getting the chance to uh, make their presence felt whether it is in the world of politics or whether it is as you said looking for jobs are women even present um, are they even being acknowledged within this digital universe that we all frankly dove into with the covid 2020 i think there's a lot of tokenism so the government wants us to believe that there's a lot of women in these spaces and a lot of times that language is co-opted so that the outcomes seem like they are favorable to women so for example the language of safety is used to justify a lot of the surveillance that happens during covid right but as feminists we know that most spaces are not safe for women and surveillance is not something that keeps women safe and what we've learned from years of history about women's bodies and women's experiences is that but when the government packages something like tracking people's data as a safety measure then they are using the language of benefiting people in order to actually control their actions and uh, you know how we were discussing earlier about perhaps privacy is not a foremost concern in uh, global south countries i feel like maybe a reason we think that is because people don't really understand the um people don't really understand the implications of what the loss of privacy could mean because the way surveillance is working right now and the way this data collection is happening right now it's happening in ways that it didn't happen before so it's not just about the government collecting our data but what happens to that data when it's in the hands of the government in some way is it coming back to me to control other aspects of my life you know when we're just submitting some data on you know for example the arogya setu app it may not seem very evident to us what's going to happen as a result of it somewhere down the line is that data going to be used to control my access to the metro my access to the railway station so unless people are really told about these implications privacy will seem like a very elite concern and i think those connections are what are missing right now and maybe if those connections are made it will become more uh, you know clear why privacy is actually an important issue but i agree that it's not the entire picture because uh, there are issues beyond privacy that are very much connected to privacy and as feminists we uh, ask for a focus on the body and ask for a focus on how different bodies experience these uh, concerns such as surveillance and uh, at the internet democracy project uh, supported by the data governance network we've been uh, doing some research around this specifically and uh, what we find is that a lot of these issues they don't necessarily uh, only infringe upon a person's privacy but they infringe upon a person's bodily integrity and a person's dignity and a person's autonomy and i feel like those conversations uh, often get left out when we speak about policies and their solutions because the focus is very much on data uh, and how data's privacy needs to be protected rather than how the bodies that are controlled through that data need to also be protected and how their experiences uh, need to be uh, you know heard so tying that back to your question uh, originally about whether there's representation i feel in that sense that is the space where we need people's voices to really be heard because we need people we need uh, we cannot have people in policy spaces completely separate you know very removed from the social realities of what people are experiencing making decisions for those people and uh, that's where representation definitely is lacking and when it is present is present in a very tokenistic manner so that's something that we'll have to begin to definitely change no excellent point uh, why you think let me get you in on this conversation of you know how to make digital inclusion good so you know that you can defend freedom legally you defend your own freedom personally you defend others as freedom and speak up for them are there other tools that you think you know post pandemic we should be cognizant of and we should be pushing harder for example we were having a conversation about this earlier and the fact that there isn't enough vernacular content out there people don't feel like it's a language they understand or they can relate to so this is you know some somewhat of uh, a creature they they don't fully understand the entire digital space 
Yeah, uh, the challenging it is about uh, how to make the equilibrium between the uh, uh, the obligation uh, of the government to uh, fulfillment of the human rights in general, especially the issue of the health and the issue of the economic and the social, and how to, uh, how the government to protect uh, the civil liberties, uh, especially the freedom of expression, freedom of opinion, and also the right to privacy. Uh, I think the currently the important issue is how the national governments uh, set up of the new regulation uh, with adopt of the several uh, human rights instrument, including of the several uh, uh, convention uh, and also uh, the international covenant on civil and political rights, for example, uh, because uh, the uh, human rights council really several uh, resolution uh, how how to the adopt of the in, uh, uh, human rights instrument in the uh, enjoyment of the internet, especially how the protect of the online activity with the human rights instrument. But uh, the, the current situation, uh, for example, in Indonesia, we don't have the enough of the strong regulation to protect of the, the peoples, uh, especially the civil liberties in the uh, online uh, medium. Uh, for example, until now, Indonesia has not of the, uh, the comprehensive data protection law. So uh, the practicing of the uh, contact tracing, fencing, and uh, tracking, they are not adopt of the uh, privacy principles and uh, data protection principle because uh, in the conduct of the populant, uh, uh, surveillance populations the governments uh, take all of the data from the portal uh, for example and uh, there is no uh, purposive limitation principles uh, there is no uh, uh, data minimization principles there is no storage limitation principle etc so I think it is uh, give the big impact to the uh, uh, the the, the the freedom of the people uh, in uh, their speak up about uh, their rights, uh, especially the freedom of opinion and freedom of the expression. Fair point. I am conscious of time and I know that there's some questions coming in from our audience as well. So I'm going to bring them up first and then if there's time, we'll chat a bit more. The first question comes in from Aisha Dev. She writes, we have justified surveillance in the name of data collection for COVID solutions. Does this lower the bar for privacy in non-COVID times? And how do we take measures to privatize our data again post-pandemic? Kuda, if you'd like to take a shot at that question, and then if there's anyone else who'd like to add to it. Yeah, uh, so privacy as a right can be restricted in some situations. Um, it has to be balanced with other rights in this case. Um, the right to health and all that. So yes, um, privacy has been infringed to a certain bit. There is a, an increase in the amount of data that is being collected. Will this stay post pandemic? Um, it really depends. We see in some um, jurisdictions like in Europe, there's already guidelines on how to deal with the data once uh, COVID has been dealt with. We already see um, the most recent uh, report, I, I, I believe, dealt with um, response to the digital processes, the digital responses um, to COVID-19 within the EU. But in some other countries, um, countries that did have uh, weak privacy and data protection frameworks, it's unlikely that we'll see any strong follow-up on how this data which was collected for COVID has to be dealt with or has to be disposed of or has to be stored. Um, like um, Wahuidi was, was, was illustrating that in Indonesia, they don't have strong privacy frameworks. So the processing of the information is really um, extrajudicial, if you can say. So it will depend within the countries and the different contexts whether this information will be dealt with. And how do we reprivatize? Um, that's really a question that I, I don't have a comprehensive answer for because every time when we talk about things like um, the anonym, the, the, uh, the, uh, sorry, um, anonymizing data, you know, like um, de-identifying data that's held by data controllers, um, a study comes up and says, well, you know what, there's still ways to re-identify data, a, a specific individuals from data that has been um, that has been anonymized. So I guess it's a catch-up scenario where people, um, data subjects, 
are always trying to catch up with the technology because the technology is evolving. Um, the technologies on how data is collected, how data is processed is evolving at such a pace that all we can do is just catch up and try to deal with that. But at the end of the day, I think what we need to, to remember are let's have good online security practices, um, different passwords for different accounts, um, change your passwords as much as often, uh, always wipe your devices after a certain period of time and try to minimize the amount of data that you share online. Would anyone else like to add to that? Can I just add a little something? Uh, I thought the word reprivatize was quite interesting actually and I was just thinking because the divide between what we consider to traditionally be private and what we think of as public is really blurring during COVID. So if you look at some initiatives by the government in India, such as we have this app called uh, Quarantine Watch app that's been released by the government of Karnataka, which is a state in South India. And that requires people in home quarantine to send selfies every hour to the government from within the private space of their home. So if you really look at it in this way, it is the government actually governing and disciplining our bodies within what is actually a private space. So the control that the government has is not just within public spaces and the data collected within those public spaces, but it extends to what were traditionally thought of as even private spaces. So I think we also need to on a more fundamental level question how these distinctions make sense in the world we're living in today and uh, what kind of privacy it is that we're aiming to protect is it just uh, privacy of a particular kind of data and a particular kind of a body or do we really want to be inclusive even there as well on it let me put you in the in the tricky spot of you know responding to some of this which is which is when does surveillance start bleeding into censorship uh, and how do we sort of fight that from happening? Uh, in March and April, we had only one test lab in Bangladesh that would do RT-PCR tests. And uh, we needed to uh, increase testing capacity, but obviously resource, financial resources and then technological resources needed to be mastered for that. So what we did was we set up a self-reporting system using uh, just basic phones. So it was not smartphones because uh, only about 35% of the people carry smartphones. Not a lot of them would be able to use apps. So we had a hotline where they would call in and there was an IVR system where they would report their symptoms. And this is how we actually between uh, March and May were able to track disease progression and would be able to, based on that data, would be able to uh, predict seven to 10 days in advance before even testing started. And we could divert testing to locations where there was faster disease progression. So now people have put in about uh, 17 million people called through, through months. And we have a lot of data. Now. So a lot of it is anonymized, but not everything is anonymized because we needed to know where people are moving right, where disease was, was spreading. So mobility data. And then now we had to sort of uh, uh, mix and match with some health data as well, comorbidity issues. So whether they had chronic conditions or not, and how likely are they going to be uh, very sick? So all those things that we had, had to analyze. So we have now health data, we have now uh, mobility data, and in future, we may actually have international travel data because airlines and airports want uh, COVID uh, negative reports, verified COVID negative reports. So these are all private data, but this is needed for, uh, I guess, uh, governments to function, society to function, even private sector organizations to function. So where do you draw the line? I mean, it's, it's a very interesting uh, debate and very interesting consideration right now. So censorship, so now we have this data. and we, we can say that we destroy all this data right now. We could, we have not done it yet, but we don't have the right regulation for it right now. So that's why I was saying earlier that we need the right regulation, right boundaries, right uh, uh, basically creation of new silos that we need to have. 
so that the data does not fall into the wrong hands and cannot really be used for censorship. We can use it for censorship within the government, but we should not. And we need a regulation, we need a framework for data sharing with, between public and private organizations. We have a lot of private data now that we would not have gotten if it was not for COVID pandemic situation. So, so the boundaries, the frameworks have not been set right now. And that's what we're working on right now so that in future, uh, situations like this will happen more and more. And uh, as travel opens up internationally, we will need to share data in a very responsible manner with private sector, with public sector. So we, without those, these frameworks, we may get into the, the, the realm of sense. We need those safeguards. And uh, how to actually wipe, wipe data off their devices. Or what does it mean to be safe? I mean, it's, it's very, even for me, who's quite technologically astute, I don't know what, what it means to set the, set the browser settings in my, I mean, there are hundred settings in my browser. I, I pick the default when I, when I install something. I pick the default when I install uh, anything on my smartphone. So even I don't know or care because it just takes, takes too much to understand all those things. And for yeah, somebody who yeah. may not be as literate uh, digitally, it would be even harder. Right. So we need we need the government to be uh, responsible and the large companies to be responsible. And that's where we need that. It does, Anil. And we're going to check back in Sci-Fi 2021 on all that data that you talked about and whether it's been de-identified or not. So that's a mental note we're going to make. Uh, there's another question that's come in which says, how do we increase data literacy in the global south? Have the efforts been thwarted intentionally to increase control? How do we teach people about data control without addressing other forms of societal control used by dominant forces. Vayudi, let me uh, you know pose that question to you. Yeah, uh, yeah. I think uh, the problems. Uh, yeah, uh, Indonesia as a as a uh, example in this situation. Yeah, uh, how the peoples uh, uh, understand about uh, how the data governments and how to protect uh, their data, uh, because uh, in a global south uh, there is no what is uh, the comprehensive uh, uh, definition about the privacy and about the uh, personal data. So the society try to understanding what is the personal data and what is the privacy. Why uh, we must uh, protect our privacy. Uh, why we must protect our uh, personal data. So uh, the government can use of the several instruments, uh, especially the uh, the laws as a so a social engineering to uh, education the peoples to protect their data but uh, in the another side the government also have the intention to compiling uh, the data from the peoples to control of the people it is a part of how the government uh, what is a use of the models of the panopticon to oversight of all of the people in their country and can manage uh, uh, of the people uh, and the uh, dynamic situation it is the uh, what is uh, the opportunity to the the government to compiling all of the data, including the biometric data, because uh, in the uh, contact tracing, fencing, etc., uh, the government have the uh, opportunity to compiling of the biometric data. So the situation, the pandemic situation, uh, it is accelerating uh, the 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 surveillance under the sorry surveillance. Uh, uh, uh in the scan yeah so uh after the pandemic uh, the government can uh, set up of the new uh, technologies and the new uh, new innovation based on the biometric data and uh, they have also uh, the obligation how to provide the strong regulation and education the peoples uh, how to handling their data how about the obligation of the data controller and how the rights of the data sub to uh, un entitle uh, their uh, data. Mm. So we have just about five minutes left, but I think Oni raised an important point about how so many of us uh, ourselves are not taking enough steps to keep this sort of safe or kosher as we can. So let me do a quick rapid fire with all my guests and ask them to list out three or four top, not tips, but top sort of ways of living that you would encourage people to uh, employ digitally and Kuda, let me ask start with you what's the three or four things everyone should be doing as a responsible digital citizen you'll have sorry, to yeah, unmute yeah 
Uh, so the first thing is to be considerate of other digital citizens. Um, if you look at this panel, there's a lot of diversity. People are from different cultures. We hold different ethics and different principles. So we need to, in a similar manner, use technologies and digital platforms in a way that absorbs all the differences that we embody. So that's the first um, thing that's, again, going back to respecting people's dignity and um, uh, and everything like that. Then the second thing is really about people that are in the know have a responsibility to teach the next person. So as we were discussing, there's a lot of beliefs such as privacy is not a priority, privacy is not important, privacy is one of those um, lesser rights, uh, for example. And we have a different understanding because these are issues that we've been working on for years, um, the need for privacy, the need for a free expression online. So we that have the understanding have a duty to break down these concepts in a non-technical way that shows other users why it's important and why we've been making noise about these um, rights for the past five, six, 10 years. And then the last thing really is to encourage um, members of the public, members of civil society to engage with policymakers because at the end of the day, if the policies are not in place, if the laws are not in place, then they, the change will not be there. So we really need, when all is said and done, to initiate processes where policies and laws are introduced that safeguard online spaces and digital platforms. So those are the three things that I would say um, they're not instant, um, they're not easy, but in the long run, they will make for more inclusive and safer online and digital spaces and platforms. No, absolutely. Thank you for that. Radhika, let me come to you for your top two or three must-dos and must-haves. And let me just layer that with another question that's come in on the personal data protection bill in India that's been pending, uh, and whether you think that will be doing the right things. Well, in a one minute, I probably can't cover all the flaws with the personal data protection bill. But uh, in a short uh, nutshell, um, there's a lot of flaws with the data protection bill. And uh, in its current state, it won't be able to handle the kinds of issues that have been thrown up uh, during COVID-19 or even uh, before COVID-19. Um, I think one important thing that we should all keep in mind when we talk about digital rights or digital citizenship is that it's not separate from physical offline rights and uh, you know offline things that happen in the offline sphere because everything that we see in what's called the physical offline world is actually mirrored in the digital world so things that you would expect people to do uh, offline are actually things you would want to practice online as well uh, the kinds of violence we see offline is the same kinds of violence that we see online so maybe the first step is to not think of these as two separate worlds in the first place with two different kinds of rules that apply there, but to see that they are really interconnected, they are linked, and what happens in one space influences what happens in the other space. And I think once we have that framework in mind, uh, we will automatically start adopting practices that, uh, I mean, not automatically, but it will be like a starting step to adopting practices uh, that, that help us move in, in that direction. Mayudi, to you. Yeah, uh, I think uh, yeah we 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 remember that uh, the right to privacy and also freedom of uh, expression, freedom of uh, 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 opinion, uh, as a pillar of the civil liberties. So uh, we try to uh, endorse the policy makers in the parliament, in the government. Uh, to uh, yeah, to adopt uh, of the human rights uh, principles, the human rights norm in the uh, providing of the new laws uh, in the response of the uh, digital innovation, especially to uh, creating the new norms uh, with the human centric approach. How to the protect uh, the peoples with the laws, with the human rights, uh, with the uh, human centric approach? Because uh, if uh, conduct of the incident uh, related with the uh, cybers, related with the digital and also the uh, information technology, the victims is uh, 
people uh, is a public. So how uh, the, the policymakers can develop of the new norm with the human rights uh, and the human centric uh, approach. This is one, uh, one phase. And the second, uh, as the people, we uh, try to uh, remember that uh, the privacy uh, as part of the uh, dignity. So we must protect our privacy uh, in the use of the uh, digital uh, technology. I think it is uh, for me. Thank you. On a final word with you, with, uh, with me adding in another question that's coming, which is whether these conversations we're having about data privacy are neglecting other larger issues like justice for minority communities, for example. Is it that we're having a more glamorous conversation? Or do you think this is an integral conversation for everyone, no matter which thread of that um, you know, intersection you may be at in, human, in humankind? Well, I think it's a, it's a very necessary conversation. It's, uh, I mean, obviously the digitally excluded or the digitally illiterate may not feel that this is the right conversation to have, but it will become the right conversation in a couple of years for everybody. So I think it is the right time because when we have everybody digitally included, if we have not solved these issues, then we have a bigger problem at hand. So we, we might as well fix the problem. So I'll talk about maybe four things very, very quickly. So I talked about the data sharing frameworks, responsible data sharing frameworks. As data goes from public to another public institution, public to private, private to public, we've seen all kinds of blending, research data, user generated data, survey data. Uh, so I think we need, we need responsible uh, uh, data sharing frameworks. Second is responsible regulation. I mentioned that earlier. Uh, and that's a conversation that needs to have, needs to be had uh, across the board grassroots, uh, uh, community-based organizations, rights-based organizations, and obviously government and, and large corporations which hold the, hold a lot of data. So I think regulation, we have to come up with together, whatever makes sense, whether it's a GDPR or the, the kind that uh, India is working on right now, we don't know, but uh, some, some responsible. Open sourcing the technologies that deal with public data so that we know what's really happening. With that, with that data, so how it's being processed. So the AI algorithms or any other types of algorithms that deal with public data, if it can be open source, then we know what's really happening there. So maybe that should be mandated. That may come to law as well. And that last, the fourth one is data literacy. We talked about it. And whether it can be made part of the curriculum in schools. So some sort of data literacy uh, in a formal way and also informal way. So formally in the curriculum, but also informally through societal interactions in social media, in TV, and many other in many other forms of informal. So I think those are the four things that I that I that I would like to point out. Thank you. All great points from all of you. I really appreciate your candor and insight in today's conversation. Thank you very much for being with us, Anil Chaudhary, Kuda Hove, Vayudi Jafar, Radhika Radhakrishnan. It's been great chatting with you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.